Hi guys, welcome to the Revive Stronger podcast. I'm your host, as always, Steve Hall, and today I'm talking to my man, Jackson Pios. Not about diet breaks this time, or non-linear dieting strategies, but more about what's been going on in his life, some of the injuries and setbacks he's been facing, some of his life philosophies. I think there's a lot of great take-homes from this episode. I certainly had many. As a reminder, if you aren't subscribed to our newsletter, get on there, especially if you're interested in some really handy emails and tips and tricks and things like this, but also for latest information on seminars, which can now start running once now the world is getting back to normal. So definitely get signed up to that. So you're here for the latest information. Let's get into the episode. Hi guys, welcome to the Revive Stronger podcast. I'm your host as always, Steve Hall. And today I have Jackson Pios back on the show all the way from Bali. And I'm excited to talk to Jackson because uh, I always like talking to Jackson because he's he's a cool guy. Um, I like following him over on social media. You should be following him on YouTube and Instagram and you're gonna find out why today. And uh, I just wanted to start this Jackson with kind of how are you? Uh, What have you been up to recently? I know you've been going through some struggles and some harder times, so. Um, but trying to stay positive, which is what I wanted to kind of talk about a little bit here. Yeah. Well, first of all, um, just to get the record straight, I've actually been pestering Steve to get me on the podcast about every week <laughs> for the last few months. So finally, finally, he let the gates down and I managed to wriggle my way through. Um, but yeah, good to chat, Steve. Uh, a lot has been going on uh, in my life since we last chatted for better and for worse. Um, Namely, just having a pretty horrendous run um, with injuries over the sort of last six months. And um, from the last six months, I've spent a cumulative 12 weeks um, away from the gym through the the various um, rehabs that I've had to go go through. Um, And I'm currently in the fourth week of a rehab block uh, at the moment going to the hospital tonight to hopefully get a checkup and some thumbs up uh, after this podcast. Uh, But yeah, it's been pretty rough because um, I sort of announced that somewhere around like the start of the year that, um, or just at the end of last year, that I was going to make my push for uh, bodybuilding competition season um, at the end of 2022. Something that just was not on the cards for the last sort of, basically four to five years because I was sort of head down with PhD and um, with the amount of work that was required to sustain that and do it optimally, uh, doing bodybuilding properly just was not viable at that time. So having the PhD done was sort of like, okay, this is my time to really knuckle down and get those one percenters really dialed in and do everything I possibly can in my ability to give myself the best chance of doing really well at these shows with the ultimate goal of um, pressing for my IFBB pro card. And I don't know if I got jinxed by some Balinese tribesmen out here, but (laughs) it seemed seemed like as as soon as those words came out of my mouth, um, I just ran into some pretty crazy, um, injuries like things that I never really knew were things before um so for example um I had a small little motorbike incident um where I had um a cut on my back Uh, didn't look like anything too crazy and I think the Australian sort of she'll be right mentality came out of me and I sort of cleaned it up a little bit with some tissue paper and that the bleeding stopped after like an hour and I thought uh it was all good um but my naivety being in Bali and having the Western immune system, which I think is a little bit soft and we don't really get exposed to all the different bacteria and things that are out here. Um, even though the wound had sealed up on the outside, there was some bacteria inside and that just started growing and growing and growing. And um, I should have gone to the hospital far sooner than I did. But again, the like, oh, let's just give it a few yeah. more days and see how it goes, uh, <laughs> came through and um, basically got to a point where I had like the size of this mango, like on my lower lap, <sighs> where I couldn't, I, I, I couldn't sleep, I couldn't lay down. And obviously I wasn't training because I couldn't even like sit on a bench. Um, and they had to put me under general, general anesthetic and actually cut into it. Um, even they said they had to cut out some of the muscle tissue. So how my lap is going to look when we go back to this is let's not even get but go there. Um, but yeah, they had to go in, cut the infection out, re-release it, um, and then sew me um, back up. So um, 
wild little things that just seemed like so small things to me in the moment that just sort of, I don't know, just got massively exaggerated into these ma massive issues that put me on the sidelines. So um, I am hoping that um, I'm on the sort of better end of it now. Um, uh, this is my third surgery now. So um, really hoping this, I've sort of whatever karma I'm paying for, I'm hoping that I've, <laughs> I've, 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 <laughs> I've paid my dues um, by now. Um, but yeah, like the, the amount of time off from training is very, very far, foreign. Um, honestly, like over 20 years since I've been as inactive as I have yeah. been right now. Um, because even little things like, because I'm all stitched up and bandages are getting changed all the time and things like that. Um, you can't even really sweat because that causes like issues with things like that. So even just going out around and going for a walk or getting steps in becomes, hold on, I've got to actually think about this now. Um, do too many steps and you're sort of delaying the recovery and things like that. So there's been a hell of a lot of couch time, way more than I've ever experienced so far. Um, and there was definitely a whole lot of like denial going on or like frustration in the early phases where I was just like, how the fuck is this happening? You know what I mean? Like, because it was just something that I've never had to deal with, like sitting on my bum, like literally with no exercise for a day starting to drive me crazy and then put that on top of me at the start of the year having all my focus on this one goal to sort of be competing at the end of the year and then have to start to start weighing up with the potential that perhaps that might not be a reality for me in this 12 months which was hard thing to deal with so i am in a little bit of a better um spot at the moment i think it's like they talk about the phases of loss i sort of yeah. made it to the ex acceptance um phase fucking finally enough but um it's been rough it's been rough and just very thankful to be able to have a, a job career where it hasn't impeded my ability to do that um and to still be able to be in a position where i can still create content educate uh, and things like that which is honestly like I say that this keeps me sane. There was probably a couple of uh, moments there where you might question things, but <laughs> um, it, it's honestly like kept me to get together to be able to, to still be able to maintain at least those small sort of routines. Um, yeah. Yeah, man. I, I can't even imagine, like you said, 12 weeks. I think there's probably the large majority of the listeners probably haven't had that amount of time off in a year because like we're just very dedicated bodybuilders. Like we, Deloading is kind of was a lot it was foreign to a lot of us let alone then like 12 weeks completely <laughs> off like an active recovery for a week it's like oh my gosh maybe if i'm on holiday and i can't access a gym i'll force myself to do that uh so exactly uh, i was gonna ask what kind of you were doing to try and fill the void with your time and uh keep you focused on other things i guess because like all bodybuilders we like to be at least feeling like we're working hard at something I guess that was the social media and all oh, the, the content production and your client work and things like that, or w yeah. was there anything else? So like in the initial, in the initial stage, um, cause everyone was like, Oh, you can just like spend so much time, like watching anime and things like that. I honestly had to cut anime off because a lot of the animes that we like are all about like training, self-improvement and, and self-development and things like that, pushing your limits, man, watching that and being like stuck in what I knew was sort of a three to four week period of not being able to do anything, man, that sucked because like I use like anime for like motivation. I watch an episode. Cool. I'm like, okay, let's go handle business in the gym. Um, so I just had to sort of step away. Basically anything that sort of reminded me about training and bodybuilding, I sort of tried to distance myself from it and just tried to live like a normal person that like it wasn't an athlete. And it was kind of weird, but that was honestly the way that allowed me to manage. So I started doing like, like going out to dinners more and like more like social things that you just don't do when you're locked in as an athlete, you know, and like would go maybe <clears throat> like go watch the do sounds weird, like go watch the sunset or things like that stuff that I wasn't usually in like an allowable regular thing in my daily weekly routine but i started doing things more like that that just put me as far away from the gym mindset as i possibly could because i found that when i was thinking about bodybuilding when i was thinking about that when i was thinking about training i my mind would just start running wild you know and you work yourself up into this frustration of like not being able to do anything despite wanting to be able to work so hard towards it so 
um, the distancing thing was definitely something um, that that helped me a lot. It was just trying to sort of get your mind away from training because it's out of your control right now, man. So like, yeah. don't even don't even bother thinking about it because it's it's a time thing, and you ain't gonna be able to do nothing about that. That time that time's gonna be there. So um, that was basically the only only advice that I would ever have for someone basically um, being in the same position. And the second thing is just trying to keep um, the mind as active as possible. Like it was in the downtime where it's the hardest because your, your mind starts just going down that rabbit hole, you know, and you work yourself up for no reason. It provides no benefits. It doesn't make the healing process faster and it doesn't make you feel any bit better about the situation. So why do we do it? But we still do. So um, yeah, distancing myself from training and the bodybuilding as much as I could um, and keeping my mind active while trying to do more content, trying to, paid more attention to my clients and things like that. So I had an external focus rather than an internal focus. No, I, I love that. I, I think the distancing is like, as, as you were saying, I was like, that makes complete sense. Uh, I think about it in loads of ways. I don't know, like it was, I can even remember like during the lockdowns and some people would have access to gyms and I, or even in different countries maybe. And I'd just be like, why? <laughs> like, I, I don't have access to this. And you do, you wind yourself up because you're like, well, what if I did this? I could like, maybe I could get access via this. And you're just like, just focus on what you can do in your situation and, and that's going to kind of calm you down quite a lot. And did you find that after the initial days of like slight insanity and being worked up, it got easier and the time passed a little faster when you implemented those things? Yeah, definitely. Um, the first few days, there was definitely like those moments on the couch where like, how the fuck am I going to do this for a month? Like at the day two, day three, you know? Um, and there is definitely like um, the, you can make things harder for yourself if you start sort of reevaluating your physique a hell of a lot during this period. Um, so one of the things that, that also helped that I should touch on is just don't look, I'm not weighing myself and I'm not looking at myself in the mirror because like, you know, even so it doesn't matter like how much knowledge you have, you understand that there is going to be a lot of glycogen in the intramuscular fluid loss here. There's going to be some muscle loss irrelevant of how you're eating. Um, and there's probably going to be a bit of negative recomp here, considering you're coming from a baseline of doing everything perfect for a good chunk of like four months. So um, just sort of detaching from that and just accepting that this is going to be some regression that's going to happen, whether you like it or not. And you can probably fight it to try to minimize it, but potentially it's going to have more of a negative effect on your psychology, if that makes sense. Um, so I just decided to um, basically keep some structure in my diet without letting the wheels fall off. Um, so I knew that I was getting at least sort of a baseline of protein feedings throughout my day that were evenly distributed. Um, wasn't putting, investing additional mental stress from being too precise with carbs and fats at the moment, because I just don't think it would, the, I don't think the benefits would outweigh the costs. And then thirdly, it's just accepting that there's going to be some physique regression that you can potentially re rebuild afterwards. But right now, just don't make yourself feel any shitter than you already are by really sort of um, nitpicking the decreases in muscle fullness and the increases in softness and things like that, that, that are going to happen. Um, so that was a big sort of turning point that happened sort of around like the week mark. Um, that definitely helped. Um, and sort of the, uh, on the, in addition to that, it was sort of just the realization that, um, this was completely out of my control. So the, the rehab, like that is a fixed timeline and it's going to be very variable, no matter what you do, like when the doctor says, it's going to be 28 to 35 days. It's going to be, it's going to be that time. Like for something like this, like they say rest, all you can do is rest as much as possible and moving or trying to um, sort of reduce that rehab time. is probably just going to extend the rehab time anyway. Yeah. So um, just sort of having the acceptance of that is like, it is what it is. Don't fucking cry about it because it already happened. And you can cry about it as much as you like, but it's still there and you're still going to have to sit on the couch for just as much time. Like ha coming to terms with that was sort of helpful as opposed to like when it first happened, it was like, why did this happen to me? How come this is my third one? I've been trying so hard at this, blah, 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 blah. You, can, you, you make yourself feel like the victim. And once you sort of get past that process, like it's happened, 
being a little baby about it ain't going to change the outcome. The outcome is set. You're having time on the bench, regardless of how you feel. So just get on with it and try to put your mind on other things. I think that's awesome advice. Uh, I see it. I know it in myself as well. If I get an injury or if even with like a kind of a, a random side tangent with the tattoo and I knew it needed to heal and I had that healing process. I was like, oh, maybe if I do this, it will heal faster. If I, like maybe I can get away with doing like a little bit of this. And I was just like, there's just no point. I just need to accept that it's going to take its time and you can't rush it. You can't outwork or work harder to kind of get through it. So, and it's like, I don't know, if you've got a scab and you start like picking it almost, like, oh, maybe if I pick mm-hmm. it off, it will just then heal. It's like, no, it'll have to completely rescab over and you have to like let it heal itself. So I think that's awesome advice. And then the nutrition, basically not stressing about it any more than you need to, like keeping it absolutely basic. Did you aim for, did you at that time kind of just mindfully eat or did you aim for like a calorie uh, target or did you just have like, I need to get these protein feedings in with mostly like whole grains, fruit and veggies and where my calories lay, hunger will kind of dictate that or how did you just go about that? Yeah, so the thing that makes, if I'm not trying to blow smoke here, but the more advanced of a lifter you are <clears throat> and the more muscle you have, if you're going through downtime, the greater regression you're going to have compared to someone who's perhaps lower down the ranks, doesn't quite have as much muscle, sure. things like that. Um, so people might say, oh, just go to your maintenance diet. <clears throat> and then you say, okay, that makes sense. Um, so do I monitor my body weight to reinforce that I'm in maintenance? And you could say, well, yeah, but that's just not going to apply for someone who's carrying a lot of muscle mass going through complete bed rest for a month. There is going to be a lot of weight loss that's happening. And does that mean you're in a calorie deficit? Hell no, does not. It, it just means that you're not providing that stimulus to hold that muscle and lean mass anymore. So it can be very difficult to really work out how you are, if you are actually in maintenance, when you're going through that regression and you're incurring that much lean mass loss in a short period of time. And you might get in the trap of trying to fight it and then trying to eat up to like maintain the weight and more often not, you're just going to start putting on a whole lot of body fat and get confused. I knew this. Um, so I just thought, I'm not going to play that game. I'm not going to play the body weight game and try to fight the losses because I know that I'm going to be losing a bunch of lean weight. Um, and I know that if I try to eat up to resist that, it's probably just going to ha- um, result in a lot of unnecessary fat gain. Um, and another thing that you need to like work out is um, like if you're going from like a 10,000 step normal day to having steps in the double digits, like how are you going to account for that? That's not something as coaches that we typically have to have experience with. And that's something for me. I was like, what's the, what's the calorie expenditure difference on that? Like, fuck, I don't know. Like, and that's a coach that's been working for years, you know? So how do we put that into the, into the um, equation? So I started weighing up all these things and I was like, man, trying to do the super precise diet like right now is, is probably just going to cause me a hell of a lot of mental yeah. tax for very minimal upside. It's probably not worth it. And I'm one of the guys who's more strict and hard ass on the diet than most people. So like, this is saying something a lot coming from my perspective. So I I decided like, it's not worth it playing that game. So I'm going to set myself a fixed meal structure each day. I'm going to pull my calories down roughly a thousand from where I was. And I'm just going to consume 50 grams of protein around about that in each of the meals. And carb fats distributions is just going to be like based on what I feel like, which was nothing too exciting. So, um, and I, I think any level of precision further than that probably is not going to inc- improve the outcome that much, but it's probably going to have notable downsides to your already significantly disturbed psyche. Yeah. Hey, Pascal here. I just wanted to take the moment to talk about our membership site. Inside, you'll find a thriving forum, an extensive exercise library, courses, presentations, and research reviews. All I need you to do is hit the link in the description below and sign up. See you there. Yeah, I think that's so well said because I think, again, as like bodybuilders, we are hardwired for like extreme precision. And it's in some ways frustrating when (laughs) you see people try and do it because it's a case of, you, you can't actually have pre- precise, pre- like you can't be that precise with your calorie expenditure, with your intake, unless you're like 
in a vacuum, literally doing the same things each and every day. But then your training varies anywhere. If it's a leg day, full body day, upper body day, what have you like that, that incurs different calorie like amounts or I don't know, you have to go to the supermarket one day and you do an extra, like you said, couple of thousand steps that adds a variable there. So I love that you just kind of like accepted, I can't be perfect. So let's just kind of be as perfect as what I think is necessary for this situation and not stress about it anymore. And also, really good advice via like if you have large amounts of muscle mass you're going to see all that leap because i think a lot of people do as you said they aim for maintenance use a scale to dictate that and then like they see all this drop off it's like you sometimes see it in like a deload for example like your weight just like drops back down it's like well you're kind of you're seeing that for multiple weeks on end um and uh, especially as someone of your size i can imagine that being like yeah you could have quite easily put yourself into quite a bad position in, in terms of kind of transitioning out of these phases how have you tended to do that i think i saw on your social media maybe it was after one of the first ones you're like i probably went a bit too hard after this because it's hard to it's like after a deload it's hard to hold yourself back but this is even even worse i imagine but even more important potentially yeah so um i'll straight up like it's it's hard to crack that you know like when you if if you are very like have that ingrained sense of like let's outwork all these motherfuckers, you know, like that hardwired mentality, it's hard to like turn that off. Like, you know, it should be off, but sometimes it's just really freaking hard, you know? And you start having these like little conversations with yourself. You're like, well, maybe I, maybe it will be okay. And like, I don't want to go too soft because then like I'm losing time, you know, like I, I got to go, go right, right from the get go. So, um, I did, I went, I went too a little bit too hard too early. Um, but man, it's so hard when like you're spending that time like on the couch and all you're thinking about through a large majority of your free time is the comeback. And you're like, and you just, you just sort of re reinforcing this belief. Like I'm going to do the best comeback that anyone's seen. And you start like, you're planning it and you're like envisioning it and things like that. And like when you're, when you're given the, the, the go ahead to go to the gym, it's like, okay, it's go time now. Now's my time. Like, we're not wasting another second. We wasted three, four weeks from that last injury. We're not going to waste another minute. We do everything perfect. And in hindsight, it was a mistake. And like, if it was a client speaking to me like that, like if the role was reversed, I'd be like, listen, you got to take it easy, work your way back and things like that. But when you're in the moment and like you're in the trenches, it's hard to, hard to see things objectively, you know? And um, when the third injury happened in quite close proximity um, to the second one and relatively similar symptoms with like infection and feeling like an impaired immune system that couldn't quite deal with battling the infection. Um, I think that was a bit of a slap in the face. It's like you not freaking indestructible and it doesn't really yeah. matter how strong your mental state is right now. If you don't have the body healthy and able to sort of drive drive the mind, then it, it's not, it's not going to work. Um, it's sort of like having like imagine like a race car driver. Like you can have the best fucking race car driver in the world that's so motivated to like win win the title, but if the car's not right, it's you've got no chance of that. You know, so um, it was a lesson. It was a lesson for me to to slow down a little bit and and just realize that I've got to pay a little bit more attention to my body here. And if I don't, uh, it's going to lead to more reoccurring issues. So um, I am quite confident that my approach next time um, coming from, which should be soon, I'm hoping, uh, if the if the visit um, goes well tonight, is to be a, a hell of a lot more calculated. So um, certainly not in the first couple of weeks taking sets to failure and certainly not sort of adding um, intensifier techniques that I usually do in my training um, and just monitoring instead of just going like throwing the kitchen sink from day one and like let's maximize from day one because I think the maximize from day one approach is just a very bad approach um, coming out of an injury or something like that despite how freaking hungry you are when you are entering that gym on that first day. I guess it's the analogy I always think of like in that situation is when you start like a contest prep and you're like, right, I'm going to hit 20,000 steps. I'm going to do 60 minutes of cardio a day. I'm going to do like, I don't know, the highest training volume. And like, you just try that, like throw the kitchen sink and then you burn out within like a couple of weeks. Yeah. You're like, oh shit. So and it's like, um, it's like, we, it's like, 
it's like we know this stuff, right? Like we know <laughs> yeah. the logic, right? But when we're so fucking passionate about something, it's like objectivity sometimes gets pushed to the wayside a lot of the time. And so we get, we start making emotional decisions and that's not always the, the, the good thing. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it takes a lot of work to not let emotions um, get in the way and, and cloud ju judgment um, and decision-making because I think when we are making decisions, when we are emotional, such as like when I've come off the back of like a period of feeling so low and then following that up with the period of like such hunger and drive to be able to come back and, and push again, um, that's probably going to distort the way you're looking at things. So um, stepping back and, and sort of just keeping ob objectivity at the forefront um, is obviously a huge importance, I think. Yeah. And then as you get back into it, hopefully as soon as possible, what's your approach to nutrition then? Because again, I imagine body weight might be a bit iffy on the way back into things as well. So you, you yeah, how will you approach that? So um, funnily enough, I weighed myself this morning for like the first time in, in a good 25 days <clears throat> uh, just to see where I was because I was going into the hospital um, tonight. And I'm down 11 kilos since my top Ooh. season weight. So the the whole what's your approach coming back is a tricky one. And I'll be straight up honest, like all of today I've been – scheming like, what's the best <laughs> yeah. what's the best approach because obviously you're significantly reduced in muscle size you're also softer and of a higher body fat than when you left off so it's like okay do we push up and reinstate the bulk right away to regain the, the muscle the lost muscle tissue as quickly as possible but this is also going to probably result in you progressing through your lean, your gaining phase or your bulking phase at a higher body fat than you typically normally would and ending it in a higher body fat than you typically normally would. And then you go on the flip side and like, say, okay, well, body fat's higher. So should we spend some time cleaning that up first? But then you go at the detriment of that's probably just going to delay the time that you regain that lost muscle. So it's like there's pros and cons on both sides. And my conclusion that i was that i'm at at the moment and god it, it could change is <laughs> is to like i know that if i was eating in a technical maintenance plan like uh, that weight is going to start coming up very quickly um as soon as i start getting back in the gym and you're starting pushing nutrients towards muscle because muscle has not been active in a month you know um, insulin sensitivity were horrible and, and things like that. Um, <clears throat> so my plan is to go into an eight-week block of having small but um, cumulative weight gains on a per-week basis. So basically what I'm trying to target is some recomp. Now, we talk yep. about recomp all the time and who recomp is suitable for, and I really do see it happen. Um, but the noobs and the guys who have had big layoffs and particularly guys of a bit more experience that have had big layoffs, they're sort of the guys that are, that are primed to be able to tap into this recomp. Now, I've never really tried to do recomp ever before because I think it's an inefficient use of time. And I think you'd be far better just focusing on one and then the other. But I sort of come to the realisation that shit if i've ever got one chance to try and recomp this is probably it yeah. so that's what i'm going to try and do i'm going to i've set myself an eight week plan um of trying to push up to close to pre-injury weights over eight weeks time <clears throat> and hopefully be able to reduce a little bit of the body fat and then once i'm at that two months deep point i'm confident and hopeful that i would have hopefully regained most of the lost muscle tissue, muscle tissue, maybe 80, 90%, that would be okay. And then I get to the tough decision making point of being like, okay, how do we look here? What are comp timelines? Is it a chance to be able to like push up a little bit more and then shred down? Um, or perhaps we're just going to, cause I know I'm a little bit fatter than I usually like to be. 
should we just spend a bit of a time cleaning up body fat and then we go into another extended push up before doing sort of a contest prep perhaps not at the end of 2022 but maybe like mid 2023 or something like that so there's basically two there's basically a fork in the road there and i don't know which path yeah. i'm going to head down but I'm trying to not think too far ahead because I get worked up and anxious about it. I'm just focusing on the next eight weeks ahead of me and just trying to recomp in the best way and best way I know that I can. Um, and then reviewing once we sort of get to that bridge. That makes a lot of sense to me. I'm completely with you in terms of like recomping as well. Like I, I see it as typically not something to target. Like it's generally inefficient, but in your situation, I, it makes a lot of sense. And I like the eight weeks because it's like, well, if you are going to recomp, how long is that likely to last? Probably not a heck of a long time. And then, yeah, you come to your decision point. And I imagine the recomp or how that period of time goes will kind of give you the, the sense of direction that you then want to go. Completely. At yeah. 100%. Because I, I was getting super worked up about deciding, like, listen, am I compete? Like, trying to make a decision now, like, am I competing at the end of the year or am I not? But, like, it's it fucking so depends on how you respond when you get back in the game. Yeah. So, like, let's just see what happens on the first two months and then we can make a more of an accurate de decision because I think making a decision now, I just don't have enough data. Like I don't, uh, it would, it would be an inaccurate decision. So that's, that's the thought process behind that. In terms of competitions, what, when was the last time you competed first of all, and then what are you targeting this time around? So my last competition would have been the start of 2017 in men's physique, Arnold classic, uh, we had like 90 competitors and I wow. landed in the fir first call out of my class. I was stoked with that. I was stoked. I think I landed like a fifth, uh, sixth place in the Arnold Classic, like international competitors and things like that. I was weighing like, I think, 87 kilos on show day. Um, so I was wrapped with that. And now like I, my last off season weight, I was hanging around 115 kilos. So there's been some tissue added in that time. Um but still, like if people say like, oh, you've added so much weight since then, but also the categories and the divisions, they've advanced so much. And the yeah. guys winning a men's physique show in 2017 look completely different to the guys winning even the men's physique show in 2022. Like they're full-blown bodybuilders if we're talking about in the IFBB scene. Um, so I do like, intend to compete um, with the IFBB Pro League. Um, to try and get like one of those highly coveted pro cards mm. um, and what division um, like people see me in a gym and they're like oh you're way too big for men's physique but in my mind like I think you guys just got no idea how truly big these guys actually are yeah. like they're, they're bodybuilders in board shorts a lot of the time um, just with like they look a bit nicer that's that's the only difference in some circumstances so I still see myself as men's to classic um for for competition um and what where i go with that will sort of just depend on the look um yeah. like I, I feel like i'm relatively objective and hard on myself when i evaluate my physique and um i can like when i when i cut down firstly um sort of um uh, late last year and i was in pretty decent shape i looked at myself as like mm, People saying, oh, classic bodybuilding, things like that. I was like, nah, like I would get smoked like at this current state. So um, I feel like I've got a pretty good eye for it. And But again, the decision making is is making it now is probably not a smart move yeah. because uh, we've got a hell of a lot to go. And I've known that I've got already, a, a, well, not now, but <laughs> if things can go back, go well in the next couple of months, um, I know that I'm going to have a lot of tissue in different places and that's going to adjust how the look is when that body fat gets taken off. So um, I, I, I won't be doing bodybuilding. Um, I just don't think I'm anywhere near good enough. Um, but men's physique or, or classic physique in the, in the IFBB is, is where I tend to, tend to compete. Hi guys, Steve here. Just wanted to take a moment of your time to remind you of our online coaching service. At Revive Stronger, we pride ourselves on providing personalized service that will take your physique and knowledge to the next level. If you're interested, check the description and sign up. That's really cool. Yeah, I know. Uh, I remember seeing your men's physique shots. And so I, ha I don't think I'd seen your legs much. I don't know if you may maybe because you're men's physique. So it's just not something you display as much. And then 
I, I don't know when it was. It must have been like a year ago or something. You showed off your quads and I was like, holy crap. <laughs> I did not expect this below the shorts or below the waistline. Like, So it feels a little bit of a shame, but I'm, it's the same for a lot of men's physique guys. They have like people joke about them not having great legs, but a lot of them have insane legs. Like you said, they're just bodybuilders in board shorts or classic. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of them could probably do like exactly. just move to classic and be absolutely fine. So yeah, I'm excited to to watch that. And I guess for you, deciding uh, you can't decide this year or next year uh, and you have no deadlines like the, the stage is always there I guess and um, yeah for you and that's something we can talk about a little bit I guess it's something I wanted to talk about because kind of like your philosophy and where you are now in your life something I've definitely noticed from your content over the last kind of few years is a, like don't know, you moved to Bali um, and you definitely look like from the outside in somewhere it's a bit to be honest actually it's quite up and down uh sometimes it looks like you're really enjoying life and then other times you're going through this shit but you can't control yeah. that right so most of the time you're trying to really enjoy your life and um it looked like a bit of a potentially a bit of a shift in your kind of life philosophy and i know you said you're kind of finishing your phd influenced that and uh, it was refreshing to me because i am one of those people that kind of just like let life guide them like i went through school i went to university i got a like office job and then I moved to this but then I just kind of go through day by day just kind of like living what I think and saving and not investing as much and spending money and things not that money spending is everything uh so it was nice to see kind of some of what you were talking about but I'll let you talk about it more clearly than what I have <laughs> yeah so I'll, fir I'll firstly just say that like uh, if it wasn't for um the injuries that have happened here moving to Bali was probably the best life decision that I've done to date. Uh, everything about it, I, I love. So it's just, I just had a rough run. So if those things were sort of taken out of the mix, I, I really have no critiques um, whatsoever. Uh, apart from there being no like diet options, anything in Bali. <laughs> <laughs> so full sugar, full fat, everything. Um, but life philosophy. So that has absolutely changed. Um, I would say that coming up through high school and transitioning into university, I had very conventional mindset, like most people do. It's like, okay, do well in school, <clears throat> go to university, get a job that provides security and financial safety, um, put a good chunk of way of that each year to save for some things that we can do later down the line. Um, try to look to buy some property as, as soon as we can. So you have all those, all those sort of ducks lined up. <clears throat> and man, did I do a 360 on that? <clears throat> I don't know what was um, sort of the instigator, but I feel like it was a realization in the final sort of stretch of my PhD where I was pretty fucking burnt out just like mentally and having to go through the peer review process and things like that, which I won't get into, but extremely, extremely draining. Um, I sort of came to the realization that I basically have a five to seven year window in front of me to do the things that I really want to do in life before I'm going to start having responsibilities. They're going to sort of start pulling away my freedom. So responsibilities, I mean, like potentially having a house and a mortgage, having a wife, having kids, maybe things like that, where all of a sudden you can't just make decisions about what you want to do because it's decisions based on what you want to do, but also how they feel about it. So with that in mind, I was like, shit, five to seven years is not a lot of time. So if it's such a short window, I want to be spending as much of that time possible doing things that I enjoy. Now, if I continued my original career plan, which was to complete my PhD and then take a position again in another university to teach, continue doing studies in more of a formal setting and work my way up to tenure, that's going to be logging like nine to five days on like a Monday um, to Friday for an extended period of time with like four weeks off of the year or eight weeks off of the year, um, potentially some other work outside of those like official hours. It's like, geez, when I think about it that way, I've just lost 70% of my days, like of freedom to be able to like do things. And it's like, that's not a great deal 
to me right now at the position that I'm at in my life where I'm wanting to create a lot of experiences and memories and things like that when I'm in the healthiest, fittest, mobile sort of position of my life. So I made the, I guess, risky decision, but I never saw it as risky because basically the decision was to go all in on personal business. So like the online coaching stuff, things like that, as well as um, education products and some other side ventures as well. I basically decided to go all in on that and walk away from a formal safe research position. But I never saw it as a risky move because in my mind, I thought a PhD doesn't expire. So once you have that, there's nothing stopping you from going back to an institution when you're 40 or when you're 38 and being like, listen, can I apply for a job? That, that potential is still there. But the ability for me to be able to live in another country, moving around, um, collecting amazing experiences with basically zero responsibilities, that, that's not going to be there forever. So I just thought, listen, I'm going to take the gamble here and go in on the personal businesses and the, let's call it entrepreneurship and start traveling around the world. And if it all turns to shit, it doesn't matter because I've always got that to fall back on if that needs to be. But if I did things the other way around, it's like if I go down the formal re research setting and I start getting this big dis dissatisfaction with life, like most people do get in like the midlife crisis, it's like it's too late now. You can't go back, motherfucker, because now you've got wife, some mortgage and your kids and things. And you can't just bail out on them. So that was sort of the, the, the mindset that um, I wanted to have is like, going in on the personal business that can create financial freedom and financial freedom to me means basically being able to generate the income that can allow you to do the things you want when you want. Now I'm not trying to sort of say like, we don't work, like we do freaking work, but we also have the ability to choose when we work and to be able to do things around that. So um, that was a big driver for me. And I do think in general speaking terms, people do sort of have the way they live their life a little bit distorted. Like the, the conservative approach is to like get that job that provides the security and the constant income and then to save a big chunk of that away into like superannuation or retirement funds or things like that. That will grow over time, but you don't get to really access them until you're like you're 55, 60, 65. And when I think about that, it's like, fuck, how much fun am I really going to be having when I'm 65 and wrinkly and old? Like. Not that much fun. So what do I want all my money like at that time for? Because I'm not going to be going for jet skiing all afternoon and riding, riding dirt bikes through the jungle like I'm doing now. Like that's just not going to happen when I'm 65. Like I want, them, I want to be able to use my money now for, to be able to do those things and create those memories and experiences because potentially later on um, we won't be able to do those things. And it's like you see it all the time. It's like these people retire with these big like retirement funds. And what do they do? They go on like four week cruises where they just sit on their ass on a cruise ship and eat at the buffet all day. It's like, fuck, is that really living? Like, it doesn't feel like living to me. Like maybe it is. Maybe I'm just sort of, uh, I'm the, mud, the waters are a bit muddy for me, but that's at least how I see it and feel it um, from, from my perspective. So um, yeah, it's just like wanting to be in a financial position now where I can actually enjoy it and when I'm healthy, fit and young and I can create the experience is not saving it away for um, a time de down the line where perhaps I'm not going to be able-bodied and things like that. And just lastly, like it, it sounds a little bit grim, but I, I came to this harsh reality last year with a big loss in the family. It's like that future that you're saving away for and putting everything away for, that's not fucking promised. Yeah. So there's no guarantee that when you get there, like that you that you will make it there. So um, that's just something for me. It's it's just really trying to maximize the value from each day I have in what I consider like the golden year block of my life. Because once I get to mid thirties, I know without a doubt, like you can't just be a fucking hooligan at that point for every day you know what i mean like responsibilities start to creep in and like you you're gonna want to have to settle down at that point if you want to sort of go into the family life and, and things like that and not just live like 
I don't know, like a fucking Dan Blazerian for the rest of your life, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you're comparing yourself to Dan Blazeri. I love that. <laughs> I imagine um, maybe you're like Dan, a, an, Dan, an Dan eighth Bl- of what he lives. <laughs> I was, was going to say Dan Blazerian with none of the girls. <laughs> <laughs> um, I like that because even for me personally, like I've now got a house. Um, you obviously actually have your dog now. So I have the dog slight responsibility. Um, I don't know how much Ryu really holds you back though. Um, probably not too much. <laughs> and um Obviously, like I have a girlfriend, she works a nine to five job. So some of these things kind of keep me like from being as free as you. But I've taken inspiration from the things you've said here and been like, I don't know, I can enjoy like a bit more if I want. I can turn down. I don't have to just like do work and work and work every single hour I possibly can. I can turn down, maybe reduce my client roster by five or whatever it is. And that opens up like five extra hours or whatever it is whatever that would be entail, probably not quite five hours, um, but it would open up some extra time and uh, I don't have to just take every opportunity to work and save money and these things. And I've already found that to be beneficial for me, even in the situation I'm in. So I don't know, I just think people might listen to you and be like, man, I'm already 35 and I have responsibilities, but even at like my age, I'm 32 and I still can definitely apply a lot of the things you talked about there, but I can't be in Bali and driving through a jungle, but I can take a day off maybe and go adventure around London and come back and what have you. I don't have to, yeah, quite take it to that extreme, but I, I think that was v- valuable, like, especially the, the future isn't guaranteed always. So don't kind of save everything for that and to the detriment of now. Yeah. Like, I don't, I don't want people to misinterpret what I'm saying. Like if you are content with your life, like working in nine to five with like a bunch of responsibilities, then fuck everything what I just said then. Like, it doesn't matter. It, it, it's it's a very personal thing that I'm talking about here. This is just sort of my experiences with it. Like, I know for a fact that there's thousands of people that like do live that, what we consider like the conservative life and they're completely fucking happy with it. So that's all that really matters is being happy in, in your own shoes. So um, I don't I don't want people to sort of misconstrue what I'm saying. It's like, oh, Jackson's saying that like, if I have got a house and kids at 35 that I failed. Like, I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying like, it, it's a very personal thing and, it's, and it comes down to like where your values are and what you deem, deem to be providing you complete fulfillment in life. And people are going to value different things. So people do value security and things like that compared to like where perhaps I might value more of like adventure and things like that above that. So uh, yeah, I just wanted to make that point so people don't sort of misunderstand what I'm saying. No, absolutely. I, I like that too. Like the ultimate driving force is it's like exercise selection or something like pick the ones that suit you and you get, get good like fulfillment out of don't pick the ones Jackson <laughs> finds to be yeah, the best. Ex- exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and um, what was I going to say there? I forgot. Oh, it was for me, it was just the sometimes I think for me at least, and it might be same for people listening is they just get stuck into like a root of life and they don't like veer from that because that's the way you live life like it's the conventional way to do it but as I don't know time even changes people's perception of what is living life changes and I think your perspective for me at least was a good one because I do get very much into like just that groundhog of just repeating the same thing over and over again and actually that's final question because I know you got to go soon Jackson with um you said you kind of lived a more normal life you're going out being a bit more social during this period of time did that make you appreciate those things more and how you want to incorporate them more maybe when you go back to like more strict bodybuilding or did it make you realize how much you love investing everything into the bodybuilding? So before this injury and before I was being a little bit more social, I was of the hard nosed mindset of like, if you're doing too much social stuff, that's got to be having a detriment somewhere to your bodybuilding. That was like, it's like, Less is better all the time. That was my mindset. It's like is the because you hear about like Jay the Jay, you know the old like Jay Cutler videos and things like that. It's like my days of Groundhog Day. Every day was the same. Like I didn't go out with friends. Blah 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 blah. And so like that sort of sticks in your mind. It's like well, if I'm having too much fun, then I can't be doing something right, you know. Um, but what I have realized with doing <clears throat> being a little bit more social is like I can still socialize and do things external to bodybuilding that I enjoy that would not compromise my bodybuilding efforts. So I think that was, uh, that was an interesting mental shift to me. It's like, as long as I have my meals prepared, which I, uh, which I can, which I can do as long as I'm always prepared, then I can 
still do these things in moderation and get that fulfillment coming from a social level, which I don't usually do when I'm completely locked down towards like an athletic pursuit. Um, and it's not actually going to detract um, from the greater goal. And I think that could potentially be helpful. Um, so I'm certainly not going to be going out with friends on a daily basis when, um, when it's prep time. Um, but it was interesting to just sort of take notice. It's like, geez, I could still do this stuff. Like when training was done and like, as long as I bought my meals with me and things like that, it's like, it, it could be done. Um, but yeah, I think with a lot, a lot of things, it's just, it, it can become a slippery slope for some people, you know, it's like deciding when to say that's enough socializing and, um, start pushing the, the, the boundaries on that a little bit can, can start detracting um, from the goal. So it was interesting. Um, I definitely decided that like the lack of an athletic pursuit or um, short-term athletic goal leaves me feeling very empty. So just like rolling life as a normal person feels like hell, hell to me. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, you know, there's just so many people just chilling. Like, I, I can't, I can't, like, I've, all, all I've been doing this last month is chilling and fuck, I'm not a guy that's going to be able to do that over the long term. I need, I need a outlet where I can apply 100% effort to something. If I don't have that, I don't know. I just feel a little bit empty. So um, it's always tough. Like, I, I feel like we've touched on a lot of like very like personal issues in this chat and i'm not sure like how will they'll extrapolate to others um because some people might associate with what i'm saying here and some people might just be like what the fuck is this guy talking about um but yeah it's been uh, that was a complete round ramble and i'm not even sure what the concluding statement will be for that but um i think when i go into this bodybuilding um sort of comeback effort that I will be trying to still have a life outside of bodybuilding that can allow me to create not just memories that I'm doing through like my physique and my business pursuits, but also memories from like a social standpoint um, and be able to do that as long as I'm not letting it sort of interfere with what is my main priority because um, I know with out of shadow of a doubt from how I felt in this last month that um, social things are never going to be, well, certainly not right now. They're just not a priority for me over um, like my business and my competitive pursuits. I think they're, they're what I think about all the time when I'm just bored and in my downtime. And I think that says a lot. No, I think, I mean, this is why I wanted, I wanted you to share your experiences because at least I know I've drawn a lot of, um, value from you sharing your experiences and going through them. And I, I think the audience will as well, because I think you'll be surprised how many people have been in somewhat similar positions to what you are now. And uh, maybe they haven't thought about some of the things you thought about or they have, and you've given them now a bit more food for thought and sense of direction. And I think definitely a, a big take home for me is like, have priorities in life and those priorities should be ultimately driving happiness. And that might look different for different people. Um, but yeah, I want to make sure uh, not so that you don't miss your next uh, appointment. So I'm going to close it here. I'll make sure Jackson's YouTube, Instagram, everything's linked below. I won't make Jackson kind of reel those out. But have you got anything else in the future in the pipeline that you need to let people know about? Or are you just going to be back at it? Um, I've got a muscle gain. I got my first ebook um, releasing uh, in the next month. The benefits of having a lot of extra time is like you can work on oh, those. Yeah cool little side ventures. Um, so I'm excited to release that. It's basically a combination of my research and experience accumulation to date in sort of um, directing you towards how to set up the optimal muscle gain diet um, for yourself. So I'll probably lose a few clients once I release that one because they'll know how to <laughs> basically grow muscle themselves easily <laughs> but um yeah that's gonna be a fun one to to get out because i haven't I haven't sort of um played in those waters just yet so it'll be interesting to see what the sort of reception is on that and then 
I know that for sure there's going to be a, a few little anime fans um, on this podcast. So Koshiro has got another release um, coming. Yes. We got some Vegeta pieces coming. We got Sasuke from Naruto and Kilua from Hunter x Hunter. So that's just like a passion project of mine, um, you know, like doing the anime, like clothing that we can wear in the gym and stuff like that. Um, it's fun for me and uh, super fulfilling when you see like the dudes like wearing, the, even when I see like you like crushing a set of like hack squats or something in the shirt, like fuck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then just lastly, like um, the a big priority of mine is to document this comeback. Um, I think that like, it's going to be all through my YouTube and I really want to show people what can be done when you're faced serious, serious hardship and setbacks when you apply 100% effort to something. And um, I have extreme motivation and drive um, to be able to come back from this and to do something special and to create a story that will be able to help others and to just, so when you do go through those setbacks, just know that you're down, but you're not out and uh, success can be there. If, if you want it hard enough. You're going to revive stronger. <laughs> Sorry. I had to, I had to do it. I had to use it, um, but we have to drag you back on uh, we, I will have to drag you back on when that ebook is released and have a, a chat through that. So uh, people have more awareness too. I think people really enjoy that. And then I just want to give a, a special shout out to Kashiro because uh, I love the shirts. I wear them all the time, as you know, very good quality. So if you are like an anime fan, definitely keep your eye out for those. Cause a lot of them are limited as well. I have people reach out to me and they're like, I can't, there's no stock. And I'm like, well, yeah, we're out get on stock, the next yeah. one. <laughs> so don't miss out guys. Um, I want to make sure Jackson doesn't miss his uh, doctor's appointment. So thank you, Jackson, for coming on and spending the time with me. And thank you guys for listening. We'll talk to you soon. Take care. My pleasure. Man. So I'm Steve Hall, founder of Revive Stronger and a coach of Revive Stronger. My name is Pascal Floor. I'm the co-owner of Revive Stronger and also a coach, of course. The Revive Stronger has probably been going solidly for three years, probably roughly about three years. Revive Stronger, to me, it is becoming kind of my child, my foster child. It's the gathering and getting together of like-minded people. We've been expanding the coaching team, which is helping us help more people. Uh, but each coach can only help a certain number of people. Right now, it's all over the place. We have YouTube, we have Facebook, we have Instagram, but there isn't that community aspect behind that. And so the next step for us is developing a membership site. So basically, we want to create a family and a community that is then benefiting from another, a really cool community for people within our little niche. It's going to be a website. They will get early access to our podcast. You can access us, ask us questions, the community aspect. We have a forum there. You can ask questions, but also you can, you can lock your journey. It's also going to be courses on there, courses, presentations on different topics, discount of past seminar footage. We will log our journey as well. We'll start vlogging. We're going to have documentaries, our entire athletic journey. Furthermore, they get access to an exercise video library. The exercises that we love for hypertrophy and maximizing hypertrophy, we're going to go through those in depth, telling you how to execute them. We kept them concise and also mobile friendly so that you can watch them in between your sets. I'm super excited to grow this community. The amount of value that we're going to be delivering is huge. And I'd love you to be part of it. You will get so much out of that. I'll see you inside.